As always, I've put a couple of copies of the sermons in my box. Um, may make a couple more for those who aren't able to, to be with us. I'll hope to, to find out something by the end of the service, we can say. Our scripture lessons this morning come from the prophet Habakkuk and from Paul's letter to the Romans. Habakkuk is writing, saying to God, God, what's going on? Don't you see the wicked? They're all around me. Why don't you do something? And Habakkuk's complaint is followed by God's reply. And as we begin to read the scriptures, let us hear the word of God. In Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse 2, God replies, And the Lord answered me, Write this vision. Make it plain on tablets, so that he may run who reads it. For still the vision awaits its appointed time. It hastens to the end. It will not lie. If it seems slow, wait for it. It will surely come. It will not delay. Behold, the soul of the wicked is puffed up. It is not upright within him, but the righteous shall live by his faith. And from Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 1, beginning in verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. The word of the Lord. Let's commit this time to God in prayer. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Martin Luther just wasn't sure. It didn't matter how many good works he did, how fervently he prayed, or how many sins he confessed. It didn't matter that he was ordained a Catholic priest and trained as a biblical scholar. Luther simply could not convince himself he'd done enough to be considered righteous in the eyes of God. And as he struggled with his doubts, the church wasn't helping. From our vantage point, we can look back 500 years and see Martin Luther as an extraordinary example of courage and conviction. We see a man who confidently stood up to the most powerful politicians and church leaders of his day. We see a professor who wanted to hold a public debate and who by publicly declaring his concerns sparked a movement that changed not only the course of church history, but the direction of Western culture. Marge, do you have an update? All right. Thank you. Thank you. As I said, Luther was one who reshaped not only the, the history of the church, but the direction of the Western culture as a whole. Next Sunday, October 31st, is Reformation Day. It will be 504 years to the day since Martin Luther nailed 95 topics for debate to the Wittenberg Castle Church door. Today's sermon, as I mentioned a moment ago, is the first of a two-part series titled The Righteous Shall Live by Faith. The series is designed to help us celebrate the beginnings of the Protestant Reformation. Both sermons will share the same text, Romans 1.17, The Righteous Shall Live by Faith. Today, I'm going to focus on the phrase, The Righteous. Next week, Pastor David will explore what it means to live by faith. Since I get to go first, and since I think it's helpful for Christians periodically to reflect on our history, I'm going to look at Paul's quotation of the prophet Habakkuk through the lens of Christian history, specifically the history of the early Reformation. May God's Holy Spirit illumine our path as we seek to better understand what it means to say that God is and that we are righteous. Martin Luther was born in Eisleben, Germany in the year 1483. His father worked as a miner, then became a successful businessman. Martin earned his bachelor's degree at the University of Erfurt, and following his father's wishes, he was preparing to pursue a graduate degree in law. He'd even gone as far as buying his books, when in May 1505, he was crossing an open field during a thunderstorm. And you could question whether sometimes Luther was a bit too bold. <laughs> 
but he was crossing an open field during a thunderstorm. A bolt of lightning hit so close that it knocked him to the ground. And having been raised a Catholic, Luther instinctively called out to St. Anne, the patron saint of minors, St. Anne, save me, and I'll become a monk. Well, Luther lived, and he felt he had to honor his promise. So he sold his law books and entered a monastery. After a year, he took his monastic vows, and a year after that, he was ordained a Catholic priest. In 1508, he was transferred to the monastery in Wittenberg, where he began his teaching career. He briefly returned to Erfurt, then went back to Wittenberg, got his Doctor of Theology degree, and in the year 1513, Martin Luther became Professor of Biblical Studies at the University of Wittenberg. That was a position he'd hold for the rest of his life. And yet Martin Luther still wasn't sure. When he became a monk, he kept his monastic rules so strictly that he later wrote, if ever a monk got to heaven by his sheer monkery, it was I. But his assiduous attention to monastic detail wasn't enough to convince him that he'd worked his way into a right relationship with God. So he began confessing his sins in such minute detail that the priests who heard his confessions basically told him, and this is my translation, knock it off. Nobody does this. Get a grip. And still, Martin Luther remained uncertain about his salvation. No matter how meticulously he followed the rules of his order, no matter how often or how much he confessed, nothing convinced him that he'd done enough good works to earn God's forgiveness of his sins. Martin Luther just wasn't sure that God numbered him among the righteous. Have you ever had that feeling? Have you ever had the feeling that you haven't done enough or that you're just not good enough for God to love you. If you have, you're not the first. Martin Luther walked that path long before you. Luther's uncertainty about his salvation was rooted in his misunderstanding of God's nature and God's work. From his earliest days, Luther had pondered with considerable consternation and great sorrow the meaning of the phrase, the righteousness of God. In 1515, Ten years after the lightning bolt, two years after he became a professor, Luther once again turned his attention to Romans 1.17. This time, however, he saw those words in a completely new light, or perhaps better. For the first time, Luther saw these words in the context of the whole Bible. And 30 years later, Martin Luther wrote about that moment. He said, I greatly longed to understand Paul's epistle to the Romans. And nothing stood in the way but that one expression, the righteousness of God. Because I took it to mean that righteousness whereby God is righteous and deals righteously in punishing the unrighteous. My situation was that, although an impeccable monk, I stood before God as a sinner troubled in conscience, and I had no confidence that my merit would assuage him. Night and day, I pondered until I saw the connection between the righteousness of God and the statement that the righteous shall live by his faith. Then I grasped the truth that the righteousness of God is that righteousness whereby through sheer grace and mercy, he justifies us by faith. Thereupon, I felt myself to be reborn and to have gone through open doors into paradise. The whole scripture took on a new meaning this passage of Paul became to me a gateway to heaven. In our era of Christian history, we might say that as Paul experienced the fullness of the phrase, the righteousness of God, he had a conversion experience. Well, what exactly does it mean to be righteous? In Habakkuk 2.4 and throughout the Old Testament, the Hebrew word translated righteous connotes obedience to an ethical or moral standard. And as one writer observes, righteousness is exhibited only through conformity to the standards set out in the word of God. In the New Testament, the, the Greek word usually translated righteousness comes from a noun that means justice. And in the Latin translation of the Bible that Luther would have used, the Latin word justitia, justitia justice, was used where most modern English translations would have righteousness 
And that's a significant detail. Because until the moment we just heard him describe, Luther's view of God's righteousness was limited. It was limited to God as a just judge, one who rightly punishes human beings for their sins. Luther wasn't wrong. The God who reveals himself throughout the Old and New Testaments is a God of justice. He will indeed punish evildoers, although, as Habakkuk noted with some frustration, that judgment may not always come as quickly as God's people would like. But Luther's knowledge of the nature of God was incomplete. Having been raised and trained in the Catholic tradition of his day, judgment was the only facet of God's righteousness he had ever been told about. Now, Romans 1.17 helped him see God's righteousness not only as an act of justice, but also as a gift of grace. And as Luther gained a fuller understanding of the phrase, the righteousness of God, he turned away from the view of his contemporaries that God's righteousness is composed solely of what theologians call active righteousness. That is, God's righteousness is his active condemnation and punishment of sinners. Now, Luther began to realize that God's righteousness also includes passive righteousness. That is, the righteousness God's people receive by grace through faith alone. The Catholic teaching of Luther, Luther's time insisted that Christian salvation required the gradual transformation of the sinner from within. To be sure, this transformation from sinner to saint was aided and assisted by God. But in the end, it was the individual's internal righteousness, whether that transformation was completed in this lifetime or after a short stay in purgatory, it was the sinner's internal righteousness that finally allowed God to declare him righteous. In stark opposition, Luther recognized that the acceptance of sinners by God as truly righteous comes at the start of the Christian life. Righteousness, Luther realized, isn't a goal to be reached only at life's end or shortly thereafter. Rather, the righteousness of God is the precondition for the life God eternally intended for his people. Luther insisted that the righteousness which justifies a Christian is not his or her own internal righteousness. Instead, it is the righteousness of another, namely Christ. Our righteousness, our restoration to our right relationship with God is the result of the righteousness of Christ imputed to the believer as a pure gift by grace through faith. Have you, like Martin Luther, ever worried that you're not good enough to be considered righteous in God's eyes? You can stop worrying. You're not. And that's okay. Because when God looks at the sins in your life, he sees the atoning sacrifice of Jesus. Freed from his misconceptions about the nature of God's free gift of righteousness, Luther became especially angered by the Catholic Church's practice of selling indulgences. Indulgences were certificates issued by the Pope and purchased by individuals as a way of earning forgiveness for their sins. They were first proclaimed by Pope Urban II in the year 1095. He offered them to those who would go on what became known as the First Crusade, a crusade to liberate the Holy Land from Muslim rule. But as one author rather dryly observes, the theology supporting indulgences trailed behind their preaching and their sale. By Luther's time, indulgences were being issued not only to absolve people of violations of the church's earthly rules and regulations, but also to reduce the punishment that those people would spend in purgatory working off those sins after they had died. In fact, indulgences could even be purchased on behalf of the deceased to free them from purgatory. In the year 1515, even as Luther was rediscovering the biblical understanding of God's righteousness, the Dominican friar Johann Tetzel was authorized by Pope Leo X to travel throughout Germany selling indulgences to raise money for the rebuilding, the restoration of St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. And for political reasons, Tetzel was forbidden to sell indulgences in Wittenberg. But when he came to a nearby town, the people of Wittenberg flocked to him purchase these indulgences. 
And when they returned, they showed Luther their slips of paper. And they announced, you know what? I've been forgiven. I don't need to confess my sins anymore. They also brought back tales of Tetzel's preaching, including his famous rhyme, when the coin in the coffer rings, the soul from purgatory springs. Luther was furious. He knew you couldn't buy your way into heaven. He argued that these certificates were a form of cheap assurance, what he called false assurance. And remember, Luther struggled with his own assurance. And he saw this as cheap grace in Bonhoeffer's terms. This encouraged people to trust in a letter of indulgence rather than in the grace of God. Luther saw God's people being led astray by their shepherds. And so in October of 1517, hoping to clarify the theology that lay behind the sale of indulgences, this priest and professor drew up a list of 95 topics that he wanted to debate on the subject of indulgences. A church historian gives an account of what happened next. On the eve of All Saints Day, October 31st, 1517, at about noon, Martin Luther walked from his monastery at one end of Wittenberg to the castle church at the other, and there nailed a Latin poster on the door. The door was the public notice board, and the poster was an invitation to a debate on the 95 topics listed. Dr. Martin Luther would preside. The debate was not held as intended, but before many months had passed, thousands of people all over Europe were engaged in animated arguments about the topic. For within a fortnight, printed copies of the poster had been distributed by Johann Grunenberg, Luther's printer, and translated for those who could not read Latin. So was the memorable document, the disputation on the power and efficacy of indulgences, or more popularly, the 95 Theses, launched. Nailing the poster to the door wasn't a dramatic act of defiance. I like that painting because it shows the, the, the church door functioning as basically the town bulletin board. It would be like me going out in the hall after the service and posting an announcement saying we're going to have a meeting Wednesday night to talk about. <clears throat> what was controversial was the poster's content. And Luther was sufficiently savvy to know that if he posted these on the cathedral door on All Hallows' Eve, what we now celebrate as Halloween, the apocopation of All Hallows' Eve. All, if he posted it on that day, everybody would see it the next day because November 1st is All Saints Day, a holy day of obligation when all Catholics are retired to attend church. Well, although Luther posted his theses just as topics for debate, they quickly became interpreted as an attack on the teachings of church councils and on the authority of the Pope. Finally, on January 3rd, 1521, Pope Leo X declared Martin Luther a heretic and excommunicated him. And still Luther's troubles weren't over. In March of that year, he was summoned to appear before the Holy Roman Emperor, Charles V. Luther arrived expecting another, another debate. What he found was that he was on trial and he was expected to recant his views. His response when asked, will you recant all that you have written? Luther's response came, became one of the most famous affirmations of faith in all of Christendom. Luther boldly declared to the assembled political and ecclesiastical rulers, unless I can be instructed and convinced with evidence from the holy scriptures or with open, clear, and distinct grounds of reasoning, I am bound by the scriptures I have quoted, and my conscience is captive to the word of God. I cannot and will not recant because it is neither safe nor wise to act against conscience. He added, here I stand, I can do no other. May God help me. Well, as, sooner, as soon as Luther left the assembly, he was kidnapped. His kidnappers were his friends who feared for his life and not without reason, for an imperial edict calling Luther a convicted heretic had been issued, and that edict gave anyone permission to kill him without consequence. So for the next year, Luther was basically kept by his friends in protective custody in a castle. And he used this time to start translating the Bible into German. That not only impacted the development of the German language, much as the King James Version impacted the development of English, but in the process, that, for the, that 
language that Luther used drew together the Germans into what um, Goethe would later call Ein Volk, one people. Luther's translation united not only the, the German-speaking Christians, but the Germans themselves into the nations that we know today. And until he died in 1546, Luther continued to teach, to preach, to debate, and to write, all with the goal of assuring Christians that their righteousness is assured by God's grace. Have you ever felt that you're not good enough to be considered righteous in God's eyes? Do you ever think you haven't done enough good deeds or confessed enough of your sins to merit God's forgiveness? You don't need to worry. In the words of Robert Mounts, Romans 1, 16 and 17, the verses that ignited the Protestant Reformation are pivotal verses in the New Testament. They state concisely and with unusual clarity a fundamental tenet of the Christian faith. Salvation is not only initiated by God, but is carried through by his power. Salvation is not only initiated by God, but is carried through by his power. To put it another way, you and I don't have to earn our righteousness. We can't earn our righteousness. We can't buy God's forgiveness. That's because our righteousness is God's free gift. Your salvation, my salvation, is God's work, beginning, middle, and end. Jesus' incarnation, sinless life, atoning death, and bodily resurrection have made us righteous in God's eyes now and forever. Does God want us to live lives that conform to the moral and ethical standards that derive from his very nature? Absolutely. Do you and I need to live in constant fear that we haven't done well enough to earn our salvation? Absolutely not. Living a righteous life means living in such a way that we constantly strive to remain rightly related to God. But the glorious truth Martin Luther rediscovered as he read Paul's letter to the Romans is that living a righteous life is not a prerequisite to being in relationship with God. Indeed, it's precisely the reverse. It's because, and only because, God has given us the free gift of righteousness that we can live in right relationship with him and with each other. It's because <coughs> of God's gift that we have this relationship. Will we be perfect in our attempt to live as God intends? No. Will our failures revoke our righteousness? Again, the answer is no. As we've done here this morning, we confess our sins. And as we leave, we do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with our God. And as we do, may we remember that by God's grace, we are the righteous. Amen.